From Tallahassee, Florida's capital city, North Florida Baptist Church presents the Family Bible Hour. Stay tuned for 60 minutes of beautiful hymns, musical groups, and solos with a special presentation from the North Florida Choir and Orchestra. Hear our pastor, Dr. Randy Ray, as he shares a powerful message from God's Word aimed at encouraging your life. Experience firsthand this time of worship and praise and be challenged by the preaching of God's Word. This is the Family Bible Hour. Thank you for joining us today on the Family Bible Hour. We're still in the series called Lost, and the message today is Look and Live. It's a very famous passage about the fiery serpents having come in to the camp, and a serpent of brass was made, and they only had to look and live. And this is a picture of uh, Jesus Christ being lifted up on the cross, and we look to the cross and have life everlasting. I hope you'll stay with us for all of today's Family Bible Hour.
Let's sing together this great chorus out of the word, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. King of Kings and Lord of Lords, glory.
Thank you, Marie. Uh, let me tell you some, uh, some Marie news. Uh, her son, Jimmy, is a student at the University of Central Florida. Uh, he is, um, I don't know if he is a sophomore or a junior there. Um, he's, which is he? Junior, he's a junior there. And um, just yesterday, uh, the, the, the Baptist, Florida Baptist Convention has uh, ministries on pretty much every campus on the, in the state of Florida. And it's called BCM, Baptist Collegiate Ministries. And yesterday, uh, their son Jimmy, who is a junior at University of Central Florida, Jimmy was elected president of all of the BCM network in the state of Florida. That is a really, really big thing. Our own Jimmy is the president, he is El Presidente of the state of Florida BCM. Let's give him a hand in absence, that's great. Great. Congratulations. Take your Bibles and turn to Numbers 21. We're going to look at verses 4 through 9 today. And the title of the message is Look and Live. On Wednesday evening at a special time, that is 6.30, I'm trying to get that in your heads, at 6.30 on Wednesday, we begin our global impact celebration. This is a time when we see how important the work of 
of missions is, how important it is to our church, how important it is uh, to the world and to the work of God. It's a time to evaluate our commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ and what we are called upon as God's people to do uh, in the spreading of the gospel. With the work of uh, missions is a sense of urgency, and we always present it with a sense of urgency. But why do we present it that way? Why do pastors like me, why are we so adamant uh, about the need to pray and, and to give and to go to missions? Why do we uh, come on so strong about this? Well, we're continuing in our series from the, uh, uh, the Lost series about the wanderings of the children of Israel, but today we're going to see something in the Old Testament that has a direct correlation in the New Testament. Now, most if not everything that you see in the Old Testament has a direct correlation to the New Testament, but this is so clear you can't possibly miss it. And the story I call Look and Live, Numbers 21 and verse 4. From Mount Hor they set out by the way uh, to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless bread. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Uh, let's just get right into the message. And the first point of the message is that there is a familiar sound. Once again, we find the, the Israelites, the children of Israel, in a state of complaining. This is where they live. They were the capital of the state of complaining. This is what they did. This is who they were. It was in their, it seemed to be in their DNA that they just complained, that they're just unhappy, that they do this thing called murmuring, and so they did. And so we find them in this state of unhappiness. Uh, it's in state of all of us. Uh, we all have a tendency to be on the negative side. In fact, I think people who are positive have to work to come from a negative tendency to become uh, more positive. And so we see the children of Israel once again complaining. And wrapped in the truth that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God is the people, is the uh, reality that we are a people who naturally lack faith. Uh, we are a people who uh, naturally worry. We are a people who naturally talk about those things that we worry about. And, and we go over them again and again. And we've made a, uh, much about Israel's uh, complaining because Israel was certainly a, a worrisome nation. They were a worrying and a worrisome nation. And it's really a big problem. Sometimes people say, well, it may not be that big a problem. In fact, we have a tendency to rate it a little bit and uh, say, well, it's not that big of a deal. Paul wrote to the Philippians and he gave them a straightforward word about life and how it should be lived. Here's what he said. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. That'd be a great verse for every parent to have their children to memorize. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Obviously, the Jews did not live by this maximum, and a lot of our maxim, and a lot of us fail to live by this maxim as well. The, the reason is because we fail in faith. And this is one of those sins that God considers great, but for us, it's mainly just some sort of a, an aggravation. Uh, we have a tendency to score sins higher than others. And a complaining spirit, while it's a problem, it's rather low on the scale. It's not up there with some of the, the bigger sins. So if somebody has a complaining spirit, we kind of dismiss, well, they've just got a little bit of a complaining spirit. But the reality is this was a huge problem for the children of Israel, and it caused continual problems for them, and God didn't like it at all. 
It presented a serious problem for the Jews, and God sent judgment because of it. And here is how this familiar scene and sound played out. Once again, they were agitated. The, the children of Israel were agitated again. They were up in the air. Numbers 21 and verse 4. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient on the way. Now they're trying to reach a land, a promised land, that is actually not all that far away. But because God has pronounced a, a sentence upon them due to their grumbling, due to their murmuring, God has pronounced a sentence upon them and they are unable to go immediately to the land. So they have to take a, a circular journey. It's, it's their, their wandering. They go around and around. That's why we titled the series uh, lost, just like the television program. They are, they are lost. They can't seem to get anywhere, and they're agitated by it. They're bothered by it. It just sticks in their crawl. They had a short fuse, and that short fuse continued to burn shorter. These people were unhappy people. They failed to realize something that all of us should know. At least we have been given a clear understanding of how we're supposed to benefit from the agitations of life. When we are delayed, when we are agitated, when we are sent in a circular motion, when God says, I'm going to give you a detour, when those things happen, there's always something for us in the detour. Romans 8, 28 says, and all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to them who are the called according to his purpose. If you find yourself in a detour, God has something good for you in the detour. And God is testing you, and it's a good thing to be tested. James 1, 3 says, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, or as the King James says, the trial of your faith works patience. This is not what it was producing, however, in the children of Israel. They were not getting more patient. They were not getting more productive. Every trial they faced, every delay made them a little less content with God's protection and even with God's provision. Their murmuring was a familiar sound because they lived in a state of agitation and aggravation. Now I'm going to pull over and park and just say a little practical word here. I pray that you are not known as this kind of a person. Because I'm going to tell you something that is not going to feel good. If you are known as this kind of person, you are tolerated more than you are embraced. People tolerate you. They don't embrace you. So, say, Pastor Ray, that's, that's pretty tough. Well, it's the reality. It's the reality. I, I, I would want to check myself. And I'll, I'll tell you this. As I get older, I do check myself because we have a tendency. I'm not saying uh, to, to those of us who are uh, beyond uh, the, a magic age. I'm not saying that we're grumblers and complainers. But I will tell you this. Some of our filters have a tendency to come off life. And, and we have a tendency to say more of what we think. And we have a tendency just to, you know, to put it put it right on somebody and and we can have that grumbling agitated aggravated spirit and if you have that kind of spirit I'm here to tell you it is not good for you in this life that you're living it was not good for the children of Israel to be agitated in fact they went beyond agitation they were actually alarmed in numbers 21 and verse 3 again now the latter part of it and the people spoke against Moses, uh, God and against Moses why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? Now, this seems to be their default setting. Sometimes in your computer, you're doing something and it'll ask you, would you like to go to the default setting? Now, that means the setting that was there uh, when you first got the computer or when that program was new. Do you want to go back to the default setting? Do you want to go back uh, to, the, to the starting point and, and do it all over again? I think sometimes this is the default setting for the children of Israel. They just absolutely uh, complain and they always thought, okay, now we're going to die. Now we're going to die. We're going to die in the wilderness. They were overreacting. They were alarmist and on and on. If I have counted correctly, there are seven occasions in uh, this wilderness journey where that the, the uh, Israelites have asked about the same thing. 
why did you bring us out here? Uh, why didn't you just go ahead and let us die in Egypt? There's about seven times. And I'm sure that in each there was a true sense of panic. But you would think that after a time they would begin to understand that no matter how dark the hour, no matter how confused the state or frustrating the situation, that God would see them through. Many years ago, and this guy's still around, he's still a gospel singer, I believe. Uh, his name is uh, Andre Crouch. Uh, Andre Crouch, I think, is still around. And Andre Crouch, many years ago, when he was first getting on the scene, uh, had a song out. It was called, I've Got Confidence. And uh, Jan and I were living in Orlando. We were, I think, in our 20s at the time, Jan. So it's been at least 10 years ago. And, uh, <clears throat> and they had this song out. And it was called, I've Got Confidence. And they were singing at a Bill and Gloria Gaither concert in Orlando, Florida, and we were living in Orlando, Florida, and so that would have been our early uh, 20s, actually. We were in Orlando, Florida, and we went to see uh, Andre Crouch with Bill and Gloria Gaither, and, and he sang, I've Got Confidence, for the very first time. Now, this is what the children of Israel were lacking. They were lacking confidence in God. Uh, I sometimes talk about the difference between self-confidence and God-confidence. It's much better to have God-confidence. Now, people uh, shouldn't lack self-confidence, but if you lack self-confidence and don't have God-confidence, uh, then you might have a false sense of confidence. But when you have self-confidence that's built on a God-confidence, then you've got real confidence in life. And the Israelites had anything but confidence in their lives at this point. They were agitated, they were aggravated, they were alarmed, they were exactly what the Bible says that none of us should be. Here's what they were. They were just plain old anxious. It, it comes to a head when they verbalize their complaints and guess what? They were ungrateful for God's provision. Numbers 21 and verse 5, the latter part of verse 5. For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Imagine being that insulting to God. God had provided for them quail and manna. And this was their sustenance in the wilderness. God made it to where their clothes didn't wear out, their sandals didn't wear out. They were able to go for all of this period of time and God had provided for them. And they have become so accustomed to God's blessings and so ungrateful for His provision that they call the food worthless. I know somebody like that. I know somebody who is always eager to find the new thing. And they find the new thing and it is the best thing that they've ever found in their lives. This is just awesome. This is just wonderful. And within a short period of time, that which was so awesome and wonderful just is worthless. It just stinks. This is horrible. I can't stand this. This person uses other words to describe it. That's not necessarily ugly words, but not appropriate for me to say here. They just don't like it. I mean, they... they they move from being absolutely delighted at what has come to them to just being just aggravated. This is the way the children of Israel are. God had provided for them. God had done some big and wonderful things for them. And, and they are, their ingratitude is just amazing. And their ingratitude has brought them to a, a great time of anxiety. It's just the opposite of God's formula for life. Here's God's formula for the way that we live. In Philippians 4 and verse 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. You know what will end your anxiety and my anxiety? Our anxiety is quelled by prayer and thanksgiving. Prayer and gratitude. It's kind of like Pollyanna. Pollyanna was on yesterday afternoon and my grandson was watching Little of Pollyanna. And, and Pollyanna said, uh, uh, Pollyanna always found something she could be glad about. 
You, you remember that storyline in Pollyanna? Well, I, I know you must be glad about this, and I know you must be, and, and the whole town just got sick of Pollyanna at first, and then after a while, the whole town developed Pollyanna's spirit. Well, Philippians 4, 6 basically says, you know something, you should find something in everything to be thankful for. In fact, that's what the Bible says, I think in 1 Thessalonians 1, 15, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. The complaining of Israel is a picture of the state of man. Our Declaration of Independence says that God has endowed us, uh, all uh, human beings, with an an alienable right to the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And He has certainly given this to the children of Israel, yet time and time again they were unbelieving and ungrateful, and they just followed out a pattern that all of us follow out in life. The, the picture of the state of the Jews and the familiar sound of their complaining is a reminder of the condition of man. They are like us. They are like me and you. Across the street and around the world, people of God's creation are in need of thanksgiving and gratitude and redemption, just like the children of Israel were. These, these children of Israel are those people referenced in Romans chapter 1 and verse 19. It says, for What can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And this is the way the children of Israel lived. They were just anxious and ungrateful. If you want to end your sense of worry, if you want to end the tendency that you have toward worry and toward agitation and toward complaining, if you want to stop being that person that other people are just tolerating because you're always complaining about something, here's what I would say to you. And this is a real serious piece of advice. This might get you a promotion on your job. This might help you keep your job. I'm here to tell you this will help you with your neighbors. It'll help you with your family. Find gratitude in life and be thankful out loud in life. Be grateful for who you are and what you have and what God's given to you. That was the problem of the children of Israel. This familiar sound of theirs, oh, wah, 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 wah. They're like the teacher on Charlie Brown. Nobody wants to hear this anymore. So we have the familiar sound. Secondly, you have the fiery serpents. That wasn't familiar at all. Verse 6 of Numbers 21, then the Lord sent fiery serpents among them and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. Now let me pull over and tell you this. This entire scenario is a picture and a pattern of the fall of man and the redemption of God. You can see the whole thing right here. With the ingratitude Uh, of the Israelites came the sting of sin. Sin began to sting because of the Israelites' ingratitude. Now this must have been a horrible sight to see. All of these poisonous snakes invading the camp of Israel. Can you imagine that? Uh, Think about the chaos and the fear. Most of us have a healthy fear of snakes. Most of us do. Uh, I know a few of you, one or two of you, I actually know one of you who is not afraid of snakes. But the rest of us consider every slithering snake a fiery serpent. We don't care what it is. If it's a green snake, it doesn't matter what it is. If it's an oak snake, I, I, we are, you know, it's, they're all fiery serpents to us. These snakes really were fiery serpents. These snakes represent for you and me uh, and, and, and for the world the sting of death. Sin came into this world and we have all been stung by it. That's exactly what these snakes represent. And it, it has uh, not passed even one of us by. All of us are going to die. The only possibility of not dying is for the Lord to come and the rapture to take place and we go up in the rapture. Otherwise, we are all going 
to die because we've all been bitten by the sting of sin. For you and me and for the children of Israel, this propensity towards sin came through the first man, Adam, who disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden. That's how it all got started. It brought for all of us the same sentence given to the Israelites who lived in the ingratitude in the midst of the abundance of God's provision. There is the sting of sin. And these fiery serpents represented the sting of sin. And they also represented the sentence of sin. With the sting of sin comes a sentence. God created Adam uh, to be in perfect fellowship with him. Did you know that? Did you know that God didn't create Adam to have sinned? He created Adam in perfect fellowship with him. And he gave Adam something that was supposed to have been a gift to Adam so that God and Adam could have had a, uh, in fact, I was talking with, uh, with Jeff about this the other evening, that he gave to Adam something that, that was intended to be a blessing to Adam and certainly a blessing to God, and that is a free will. He gave Adam the free will. He gave Adam the the ability to choose. And Adam's choice uh, was to have fellowship with God. And and they were created for fellowship. And when he gave uh, Eve to Adam, that fellowship was to continue. Nothing changed. Just because Adam got married did not mean that Adam no longer was devoted to God. Uh, There was supposed to be a devotion together. And there was a devotion together. And uh, they walked before God, and I believe that they visited with God. I think they visited with God in the, in the cool of the, the day. Uh, but once they sinned, once sin came into the world through Adam, once sin came in, then um, all of that fellowship changed. Once they sinned, the innocence was gone, and the presence of the Lord uh, took on a different meaning for them. They were told in the garden, You can eat of anything in the garden. I've got this garden for you. Anything in the garden you can have. However, there is a tree in the middle of the garden. It is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, don't eat from that tree. That is the one tree that you're not to eat from. Now, most people think it was an apple. I don't think it was an apple. I don't know what it was. Uh, It was probably a banana. I'm serious because that would be more appealing. Thank you very much. He said, look, you can eat of anything in the the garden, but not that one thing. You can't can't eat of that. Well, here comes Satan. And in Genesis 3, here's here's what Satan said to Eve. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of of any uh, tree in the garden? And then the story went on from there. And, of course, he tempted her to Eve, uh, eat, and then she tempted Adam, and Adam had received the commandment and took the responsibility, and when he took the responsibility in Adam, we all received the sentence of sin. It was through this act of sin that the world became guilty before God. We are born in sin. Now, we're in a state of innocence until we come to a knowledge of sin, the way that Adam and Eve came to a knowledge of sin in the Garden of Eden. We come to a knowledge of sin. We Baptists call that the age of accountability. Children often come to an understanding that they need to be saved, and they often come in an early age. And like the serpent sting in the wilderness, <clears throat> death began to sting all of us, and it's still stinging today. Romans chapter 5 and 12 says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Now, apart from coming to Jesus, we are all destined to die. The the sting of death, however, is the second death. And and that is something that awaits for us. You you say, Pastor Ray, we're all going to die so none of us can be saved. There are two deaths. And the sting of sin is found in the second death. When Adam and Eve died, they experienced the sting of sin. I know this is a whole big, long theological thing. You say, well, then did they go to hell? I don't think that they did. And the reason is because God made for them skins, and I believe that they received that as a sacrifice. And I think that was the first foreshadowing of the sacrifice to come in the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. But the second death is the, is the one that is, is the... The first death is inevitable. We're going to die. We were, we were made to live forever. We're going to die. 
Now, the second death is the one that we're preaching around the world that you can avoid. In, in Revelation 2 and 11, it says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. And then that second death is described in Revelation 20 and 14. The <clears throat> death, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. And this is the second death, the lake of fire. So we've all accepted that death is inevitable. But the second death is something that can be changed. And this is something that we're trying to get changed. And the reason that we go to missions uh, across the street and around the world is to see the second death nullified. To see that, that people who are doomed to the second death do not have to have the second death. Some of you, you may not have been born again. See, if you're just born the first time, you're born to two deaths. You're born to the first death, and you're born to the second death. The first death is physical. The second death is that spiritual death. It's the lake of fire. It's the horrible thing. But when you're born again, then that nullifies the second death on you. Your flesh still has the first death, but your spirit doesn't have the second death because you've been born again. Some of you may have not been born again. You say, Pastor Ray, we're church members. That's not being born again. Uh, we got baptized, that's not being born again. Now, if you got saved before you're baptized, then thank God you, you, that is being born again. We give that you, you can't buy salvation. To be born again is, is to do something that will allow you to escape the second death. It, it's the same scenario again that played out in the wilderness for the children of Israel. Let's take a look at this faithful Savior. When the Israelites realized what their sin had brought to them, the voice of complaining became the voice of repentance. That's what we read in verses 7 and following. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he uh, take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look to the bronze serpent and live. When I was in seminary, I sang in a, uh, a men's all a cappella choir. And uh, I sang bass in that choir. And uh, there were about 40 of us, and we traveled. And we sang, <clears throat> a lot of, uh, we sang a lot of old music. We sang music that you don't find anymore, and, and music that was so old that when it was introduced to us, uh, in this case, back in the 70s, I'd, I didn't, I'd never seen it before. And, and they introduced to us a song, uh, Mrs. Brown, Donella Brown, our choir director, introduced to us a song that was called Look and Live. It was written in 1887. And here's, here's how it goes. I'm not going to sing it, but it says, I have a message from the Lord, hallelujah. This message unto you I'll give. Tis recorded in his word, hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. And then the chorus says, look and live, my brother live. Look to Jesus now and live. Tis recorded in his word, hallelujah. It's only that you look and live. Have any of you ever heard that song before? Would you raise your hand? A few of you have. It's a great old song. Well, this is the message of Moses to the errant children of Israel. And this is the message of our missionary call. Look to Jesus and live. They were to look to the brass serpent and live, and it was a picture of looking to Jesus and live. Very quickly, let me just give you the, the, the basics of this. First of all, there's confession. Before salvation can come, there must be an acknowledgement of sin. The Jews uh, knew that the confession of sin was the first step in stopping the horror in the camp. The first step in the world realizing their lost condition is to, uh, is to confess their sin, to realize that they are sinners. That's what we're dedicating this whole GIC to, to people realizing that they are sinners and in need of a Savior. And the sting and the, the bite of of sin is ravaging to the world and we're trying to we not only see that in our own lives but we're trying to get that message across the street and around the world the Israelites knew exactly what had uh, they had done and confessed their sin there there's no such clarity in the world today uh, the world doesn't understand the world is living today in darkness the Israelites knew they had Moses there to tell them but they are living in darkness today and and they must be told of the Savior 
Romans chapter 10 and verse 14 says, How will they uh, call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him on whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. We are in the business of sending people to tell the message so others will hear. That's what the book of Romans says that we're to do. And it goes all the way back to what this picture that we're seeing in the, the wilderness with the fiery serpents and the serpent of brass raised up so that folks would be able to look and live. So first of all, there's had to be a confession. They had to realize that they were lost. The world has to realize that they are lost before they come to Jesus Christ. We go and preach that message. Secondly, there was intercession. Moses prayed for the people. He, he knew their condition and he was moved to prayer. One of the legs of our GIC is the imperative of prayer. Out give, out go, out pray. Moses prayed uh, for an answer, and we pray for someone to take the answer. Uh, Jesus said in Luke 10, 2, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. That's what Jesus said. Those are Jesus' words. He said, look, there's a harvest out there, and it's got to be harvested. Now, you need to pray, and, and, and there are laborers to be sent into the harvest, so pray that more laborers will get into the harvest. That's what missions is. We're sending laborers into the harvest. When Moses prayed, God provided. The picture is the story. It's the complete story of our salvation. When the disobedient were bitten by the fiery judgment of God, they had only to look and to live. The serpent of brass was lifted up that they might look and live. Here is how Jesus likened himself to the serpent of brass. John 12 and 31, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show of what kind of death he was going to die. Do you see the correlation here? Do you see the correlation between the sting of sin and the, the salvation that was in the uh, looking to the fiery serpent? Do you see the correlation that is between the sting of sin and the salvation that is in Jesus Christ who was lifted up on the cross of Calvary? Someone has said that you can find Jesus in every book of the Bible. And in the story of the fiery serpents, he is the one lifted up, and those stricken in their sins could live. Jesus is the victory over the fiery serpent of sin. Jesus is the victory over the sting of death. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 asks this question. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Again, right back to Numbers 21. And then it goes on and says, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Numbers 21, and then verse 57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Can just one saved person say amen? That's it, right there. That's it. That's the picture. That's what you're seeing in this fiery serpent scene. There are people that think, well, the Old Testament has no correlation whatsoever with the New Testament, and I'm here to tell you it has every correlation with the New Testament. I call on you today to look and live. If, if you have not come to that place where you know for certain that Jesus Christ is your personal Savior and Lord, I call on you today to look and to live I call on you today to realize that there is a lost and dying world in need of the message to look and to live. I hate to say it like this, and I don't mean so, to be so seemingly shamelessly promoting, but, but some, of, some who are hearing this message have not even thought about whether or not you're going to participate in the Global Impact Celebration. You haven't even thought about what you said. Well, I don't know if that's something I want to go to. Look, it's the picture of why you're saved. It's, it's, it's in your DNA. The fiery serpent of sin has bitten you. And because Jesus was lifted high and uh, on the cross of Calvary, you look to that cross and you live. And that is the message we've got to take to the world because the fiery serpent of sin has bitten the whole world. They've all been bitten. They cannot hear without a messenger. And the messengers cannot go unless they are sent. 
Our mission field is as close as our neighborhood and as, as near as our front door. And our message is very, very clear. Look and live. We have a message from the Lord. Hallelujah. A message unto you we bring. It's recorded in his word. Hallelujah. It's this message that to you we sing. Look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. It's recorded in his word. Hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. You have been watching the Family Bible Hour, a ministry of North Florida Baptist Church in Tallahassee, Florida. If you would like a copy of today's message on CD or DVD, write to us at Family Bible Hour, 3000 North Meridian Road, Tallahassee, Florida, 32312. Visit us online at nflchurch.com or call us at 850-385-7181. Join us again next time for the Family Bible Hour.